Good afternoon and welcome to Madison. We're very excited to present to you today on the fiscal impact of development patterns. We have Chris Lynch from Smart Growth America. He is the Vice President of Economic Development and Patrick Lynch from Smart Growth America as well. He is their Research Director. Um, I want to thank all of the people who have come out today on this beautiful day uh, to visit with us and to learn about this fiscal impact tool. I also want to thank all of our members who are online and joining the presentation virtually. Uh, we have been very honored to be selected by Smart Growth America to be a pilot city for the creation of this fiscal impact tool. We appreciate all of the hard work that SGA has done to get us to this point in delivering this wonderful tool for our city. Um, we also appreciate that they've taken the time to visit us today and share this information with Madison and give us a chance to showcase the things that we're doing in this city. Um, we've worked very hard um, on developing these sorts of tools and thinking about what does it mean to grow sustainably. Uh, we worked with CARPSI and Steve Steinhoff is with, with us today. The Capital Area Regional Plan Commission helped us uh, to form a sustainable communities partnership in this area. That led to our uh, relationship with Smart Growth America. So we're very fortunate to have had these uh, partnership opportunities that have resulted in the development of this tool. Uh, we have had a huge number of staff in the city of Madison working on this project from our public works division, from fire and police, and from the school district, and we've been very fortunate to have Brian Grady from the planning division lead us in this effort. So I just wanted to give you an idea of what we're going to go through today. First, we'll have a presentation, uh, some opening remarks from Mayor Paul Soglin, and then we'll get into the presentation of the fiscal impact model. Then I will talk a little bit about how we plan to use this tool in Madison, and we'll open up the presentation for question and answer at the end of the, uh, at the end of the 45 minutes. So with that, I would like to introduce Mayor Paul Soglin. Please come to the podium, thank you. Thank you, Catherine, and I really do want to uh, welcome Chris and Patrick to Madison and express their appreciation for Smart Growth selecting Madison for this, this project. Here in the city of Madison, over the years, we've taken pride in the fact that we've repeatedly attempted to uh, get the maximum density and efficiency in our development uh, compared to some of uh, our neighboring communities in and around Dane County. We've generally managed to get at least eight times the density on every acre of land that, that is developed, but that's not good enough. Uh, it doesn't tell us uh, what we could have done that was better. It doesn't tell us in terms of operating costs and maximizing the infrastructure that, that goes with the development what the best possibilities might be. Uh, we're, we're data-driven, and in terms of using SGA's model, uh, we see that this can perhaps give us new opportunities, not only in terms of efficiency and economics, but also in terms of the environmental consequences of our development. We're going to be looking at, for example, uh, major infrastructure investments in transportation, which I'll come back to in a moment. Uh, sewer, water, uh, police and, and fire district stations, and looking at the step increase in, in regards to costs. There's long been a, a recognition of the relationship between our land use and the consequences in transportation systems. Uh, doing one without the other uh, is, is, a, is a real challenge if we're sincere about the legacy that we're going to leave within the community. Taking it to the next step, which is not just looking at the land use and the relationship to transportation, but to layer it now with a discussion of long-term costs, not just to us, but to other uh, systems such as the school district, um, such as the Metropolitan Sewage District, are all important variables that have to go into any kind of analysis. So here to share some of that with us, uh, we've got from, from Smart Growth uh, two, two of, of their really uh, committed uh, leaders, 
And so rather than taking up any more time and generalities, uh, I think it's time to get to the specifics. So thank you and welcome. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, on behalf of Smart Growth America, my colleague uh, Patrick Lynch, I'd like to thank everybody here, uh, the mayor, uh, uh, planning director, Catherine Cornwell, and, and all the staff who have worked with us to make this possible, and uh, all those, who, of course, who have welcomed us uh, here uh, on this lovely day in Madison. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the model that we've created and how we've applied it to Madison to generate some results. Uh, Catherine will be talking again a little bit more about you know, the, the uses of that information here afterwards, and we'll take uh, questions and answers. So let me begin by speaking generally about uh, what this is really all about. Uh, you know, every community makes decisions about how it should grow, where development will occur, on, on what terms. A lot of people aren't aware of the fact that these things are made according to decisions that communities have made. Uh, sometimes they're sort of on autopilot because we put rules in place a very long time ago and uh, we think of them as laws of nature. Um, at least the average person may and not realize that the reason development is happening the way it is is because we set down zoning regulations and we put in place certain kinds of tax policies and we make decisions about where we're investing in infrastructure and through these we have a big impact on, on what the pattern of development will be. Some of these uh, plans, of course, go back quite a while, and they get revised from time to time as we have to look at them and uh, reconsider what uh, new realities bring. Uh, in the 21st century, communities are having to make a lot of decisions about the nature of their development and whether they want to have continued dispersed development of a low-density nature that uh, consumes a lot of land, which is mostly what we did in the second part of the 20th century, or whether they want to try to, co to create more compact development closer to things uh, like activities, like uh, transit centers and that sort of thing, uh, which increasingly the market is telling us uh, in the 21st century is what's desired. Uh, but every community has to make its decisions about how it's going to do that. Uh, every community has to think about, as it looks toward the future, do we want to continue building as we have been doing and allowing development to go where it goes based on the rules we put in place some time ago, or do we want to modify things? Uh, do we want to uh, think strategically about focusing development? Do we want to think about revitalizing areas that have been long established in which we already have infrastructure? Or do we want to develop new areas, and if so, where and how? These are the decisions that have to be made, and everybody to one degree or another is having to think about that as we go forward. As it happens, uh, we know from research that goes back decades uh, that there is a difference in the pattern of development in terms of a whole range of issues. Uh, many different uh, studies have been done about the impact of, say, sprawl, meaning spread out low, uh, low density development compared to more compact or concentrated development in, in a walkable environment. There was a seminal study back in the 1970s on the cost of sprawl. It's been redone a few times. Uh, but every day you, you, you'll hear reports, uh, this uh, one headline here is from just about a week or so ago from another study that came out. Many of these look at all kinds of different costs that are associated with sprawling development uh, and uh, you know, these range from uh, impacts on private costs, on uh, environment and, and a variety of things, health effects. Uh, but here today we're focusing really on one thing which is uh, to what degree does the choice of development pattern impact the cost of doing business as a local government? How does it affect the budget that every local government has to adopt every year? How does it affect the tax revenues and the costs of infrastructure and services that a local government must provide? Uh, there are also more and more studies showing that uh, compact development in a walkable environment generates higher value and therefore, since most local governments are to one degree or another dependent on property tax, there's a pretty direct correlation between uh, premiums and real estate values and uh, the fiscal health of a community on its, uh, on its revenue base. Uh, but other things as well, such as sales tax and all, are clearly affected by this as well. And as I said, um, a lot of research is showing that there's higher values. So this suggests that there's a premium uh, to be had by more compact development, that is, uh, as I'm going to discuss in more detail and as, as Patrick will describe, uh, the expenditures uh, tend to be driven higher when you have more dispersed development for reasons that 
uh, are comparatively straightforward. If you have more roads per capita than each per capita, which is to say taxpayer is in, in effect bearing a higher burden for the road, the infrastructure that goes under the road, the pipes that bring water to homes and uh, to office buildings and bring water away from those uh, need more miles when you're more spread out. Fire protection has to be uh, done on the basis of response time, which means that if we're in a more low density environment, we need more fire stations and those uh, that equipment has to cover more miles. School buses need to go farther uh, to pick up children uh, to bring to school. The you know, garbage trucks that uh, have to come to our houses every week, again, if they have to cover more miles, uh, they have to obviously burn more fuel and be operated a um, you know, longer amount of time for every given household and so on. Uh, so there's an expense related, and as I said, this is something that's been identified for many decades. Uh, just uh, one decade ago, basically, uh, there was a report from a Brookings Institution that uh, kind of summed this up by saying that compact development patterns and investment in projects to improve urban cores could save taxpayers money and improve overall regional economic performance. So this is not itself something that is new. Um, what is the issue, though, is that Notwithstanding this general kind of understanding, uh, it has not become a standard part of the evaluation of developments, of large-scale development plans, uh, to try to quantify this. And uh, I think part of the, the difficulty we've had in uh, some of the development uh, that's occurred in, in recent decades and actually uh, achieving uh, much of what uh, you know, a planning practice would suggest is uh, in the best interest of communities has been the lack of quantification on a regular methodical basis and the failure to incorporate that into you know, regular, uh, the regular decision making around uh, approving new plans and new developments. Uh, and that's what we want to try to address. Uh, two years ago, Smart Growth America uh, released a study called Building Better Budgets in which uh, we surveyed a number of studies that were done, again, individually by communities all around the, uh, the country in about 17 cases and you know, found that the, the result you know, showed in varying degrees, but pretty much the same way around with savings on infrastructure for more compact development of up to 38%, savings on services on regular budget of 10%, those are things you pay every year, uh, and revenue generated as much as 10 times higher. Uh, I should say that a number of folks, notably Joe Minicosi, uh, works out of Asheville, North Carolina, have been showing the tremendous difference in the re revenue generation potential of co-located business, which is to say uh, on a main street as opposed to uh, businesses that are isolated uh, in drive-only locations. Uh, and that's that combination of cost and revenue differences suggests the fiscal return that can be had with more compact development. So what we want to do is to try and uh, sort of systematize this, make it uh, something that is more routinely part of analysis and that is incorporated into local planning decisions uh, to get better, you know, better policy making uh, on land use and transportation to be fairer to taxpayers uh, by making this a routine component as much as possible for planning development and approval. Uh, this has the potential to give communities that are increasingly struggling with, you know, fiscal tensions uh, to find ways to do a better job of using their own funds and uh, strengthening their uh, fiscal base going forward for the future. We're doing this under, uh, initially under a grant uh, from the Department of Housing and Urban Development, uh, for which um, Madison is separately a, a grantee and has been working under that grant for a few years. Uh, and we're working with a number of communities around the country, in part so that we can get an idea of how this works out quantitatively under different circumstances. So uh, although this is the first community we're presenting in, uh, we're working with others in different circumstances, some that are more rural, as in New Mexico, uh, you know, comparably sized uh, smaller city in Macon, Georgia, but larger metropolitan areas in Indianapolis and, uh, and Nashville and so on. Uh, and when we get, you know, kind of an accumulation of this, I think we'll start to know something that will be more generally, uh, more generally useful uh, and will allow us to more, draw more general conclusions about development patterns on a national basis. But uh, one of the things we're trying to do here is tailor the actual analysis to each community. So rather than bringing in arbitrary numbers that, you know, based on what people think something is, we want to uh, derive the, uh, the parameters from the data in the community we're working, which is part of what you're about to see um, that my colleague will present. Uh, and so I'm going to turn it over now to Patrick Lynch, uh, who is our research director, and will describe to you how the model works and what we found.
Thanks, Chris. So, yeah, I'm going to, to start to talk about how we did the, the cost modeling and, and just give you an idea of the basic mechanics behind the model. Uh, we won't actually get into the, the spreadsheets because I think that would bore you all. But, um, you know, just to give some background, people have obviously been doing fiscal impact analyses for a long time. And the basic approach behind that was to use what's called that, the average cost approach, which is to say you would find out what the total expenses were uh, in, in the municipality for any given cost item divide them by the total number of residents and employees in the jurisdiction, and that's your average cost. So for any new development, you would apply that average cost uh, to the number of residents and employees that would be added, regardless of how uh, the development was laid out. It could be two units per acre or 20 units per acre, but those average cost metrics would stay the same. Um, obviously, that, that's useful because it's very easy to do, um, but we do think it misses um, a lot of this variation in cost that, that we know is there based on these previous studies. So that's what we're trying to do, is we're trying to um, come up with different average costs uh, based on the density of the development pattern. That's kind of the goal of this model. Because that's our basic, basic hypothesis. As, as this shows, I mean, on the left, you have uh, Tyson's Corner very sprawling. There's a lot of distance between places. There's a lot of roads, uh, you know, for every given household, uh, whereas the community on the right you're using all, all that infrastructure much more efficiently. So our objective here is to quantify what that means in terms of costs to the municipality. So we looked at a variety of cost items um, that, that most municipal uh, budgets face. And as you can see, here's kind of the basic list. And, and uh, fire, roads, stormwater, sewer and water, solid waste, and schools were the ones that we thought had the most obvious relationship to density. So for fire, it's, it's a question of how many people and how many uh, customers can you serve within uh, a given response shed for the, the fire engine. If, if it's more dense, uh, it should lead to greater efficiencies. Uh, for roads, it's a question of uh, you know, how much distance is there between uh, households. Uh, if you have a lot of people, for a given area of road, then you're using that more efficiently, and so the average cost per capita should be lower. Uh, for stormwater and sewer and water, it's, it's kind of a similar relationship to roads. We're basically assuming that, particularly for sanitary sewer and, and pipes, that they uh, follow the length of the roads. So once again, if it's more dense, uh, you should have uh, fewer length, uh, less length of, of pipes per person. For solid waste, it's kind of a similar question to fire if you have greater distance between homes, that means uh, more time that, that the fire truck or that the solid waste truck must travel uh, between destinations, and that means uh, that all else being equal, uh, that, the, uh, that, that the pickup, that the truck will have to take longer to pick up the same amount of garbage. It will also mean that it will burn more fuel uh, and perhaps uh, take on more maintenance costs. Um, and then for schools, of course, it's just uh, transportation. Uh, you have more people living further away from school, more people, more students that, that need to use buses. And then, of course, the buses uh, may need to travel further in, in a less dense environment as opposed to, to one that is more dense. And then we have these other categories, such as libraries, hospitals, parks, that we didn't see an obvious connection to density. One could perhaps make an argument that there, that there is, but we didn't see an obvious one, or, and we didn't see a way to model it. And for police in particular, we think there probably is some connection to density, uh, but it wasn't obvious, and uh, you know, we, we were not able to team up an approach at this time to, to effectively model that, so we haven't tried to do that. So let's talk about roads uh, and, and water and sewer first. Um, the way we approach this is we, we took the entire Madison metropolitan area, and we divided it up into 40-acre grids. And in each one of those grids, we totaled up the number of people and the number of employees. We did that based on census data. Uh, we kind of translated census block data to, to each of these grids. And then we were also able to total up the, the length of roads in each of those uh, grid cells. And if we do that, we kind of we come up with this chart. So each one of those dots represents a grid cell. And on uh, the vertical axis, you have the square feet of road per capita. And then on the horizontal axis, you have the population and employees per acre. And so the basic relationship you see uh, is that as density increases, uh, the square feet of road, the area of road per capita tends to decrease. Um, and, and in fact, as you get into the very low densities, it, it increases uh, dramatically. Um, so we tried to clean this up a little bit. Uh, and basically what we did is we averaged up 
the uh, you know for each density category, if it had you know, been you know one to two uh, residence employees per acre, we averaged up all of those grid cells uh, to produce one dot. Um, and we, when you do that, you come up with a better correlation and uh, a more reasonable curve. And so that's kind of the the, the formula that we can now use to estimate the number of the, the quantity of roads that would be needed for any given development, even if you don't have a particular site plan. Even if you're talking about very long-term, large-scale developments, you can use this formula as a guide to estimating uh, how much infrastructure it's going to need. You know, assuming it, it conforms to um, you know, previous development patterns within you know, density categories. And just so you can see what this looks like, so um, you know, uh, on the top right there is a picture of, of what that looks like. That's a, you know, an area of uh, you know, roughly 4.6 residents and employees per acre. And uh, that, that equates to about 30 feet of road uh, per capita. But if you go to downtown Madison, uh, it's only about 3.1 feet of road per capita. And so obviously that has cost implications, just if you, if you think of the, uh, the maintenance required to maintain the roads uh, and the pipes uh, underneath it. Uh, and just to give you some information, we, we performed the same analysis in a few other places. This is West Des Moines. We found a very similar relationship. Um, this is in Arlington. The Arlington example is useful because uh, Arlington actually has uh, a lot more grid cells with high density. And so we were able to confirm you know, with more data points that the higher density areas actually do have a, a much less road area per capita than the, the lower density places. So well, let's talk about the water and sewer. We, we basically assumed uh, that water and sewer pipes would run underneath the length of the road. So the model assumes that uh, whatever road length you need, you also need the same length uh, for water and sewer pipes. And then the question is, um, you know, does the, the revenue that you would get uh, to serve that development, would it cover the cost to maintain those pipes or you know, would it not? Would you need to basically put in more money? And, and that's, the, that's, that's the question that, that we are asking. And so, um, you know, most utilities set their rates to cover their costs. So what we've done is we've said, okay, for, you know, the entire city of Madison jurisdiction, there's a certain amount of pipe that must be maintained. We know the amount of revenue from public financial statements, et cetera. Um, and so we know that that rate revenue covers that, that amount of pipe. Uh, but then for the developments, we can say, all right, how much revenue are we projected to get based on, we use some third-party estimates about water usage per capita. Uh, so we know roughly how much revenue they'll generate. We know how much pipe will need to be maintained based on a road formula. And then we can see you know, what that ratio is of pipe maintenance costs to uh, projected revenue generated and see how that compares to the citywide average. And to the extent that the pipe maintenance costs are greater than the citywide average, uh, we would say that that development loses money, essentially. Uh, or if it's more dense and there's less pipe to maintain, it may make money, at least relative to the city average. So that's, that's how the, the water and sewer model works. Um, for school transportation, you know, just to, to give you an indication that clearly there is a relationship between transportation costs and density, this is based on data from the Wisconsin uh, Department of Public Instruction. They actually track a lot of this data. Um, and you can see that if you look at the transportation costs per student, uh, it, it increases dramatically in, in the low density school districts. And then as the density increases, uh, it drops a fair amount. Now, because this is for an entire district, uh, we couldn't really use this uh, for a, a given development. Um, so instead, our approach was to try and figure out how many students would be located within the walk zone of a school. Um, and I, I, I believe in Madison, it was a one mile walk zone, and maybe it was one and a half. But um, you know, we can figure out based on the number of housing units per acre, you know, how many students are likely to be located within the walk zone, just assuming that each household generates a, an average number of students. And what we found is that for elementary schools, which are typically much smaller schools, even at relatively low densities, you could theoretically uh, put most of the students within the walk zone. Uh, and so that even at four units per acre, um, you could theoretically you know, accommodate all of the, the 400 students within the walk zone. But for Middle school, in particular for high school, uh, the, the density becomes very important. At, at low densities, um, for high school, you would have to bus you know, the majority of your students. But if you move up to uh, you know, 12 units per acre, you could actually fit all of them within the walk zone, which means you could reduce your bus costs 
uh, for that high school to, to zero. Um, so there is, there is certainly um, you know, cost savings to be had uh, with higher densities for the schools. Um, and I should say, you know, this, um, this model does not uh, specifically account for the capacity of any individual schools. We did not get into that. That was going to be too complicated. Uh, nor does it account for specific bus routing questions or things like that. That was also going to be uh, too complicated. So it's actually not accounting for all the costs that, that could be associated with this, like the greater distance. It's really uh, just a function of how many students would need to be bused. Then uh, just talking about fire in general. So the, the question in fire really is, you know, how many uh, customers are you serving within the four to five minute uh, response shed area. And for that, we kind of fig tried to figure out, okay, what's the acreage of a typical response shed? If you assume, you know, a certain time for dispatch and then a certain time for the, the fire truck to travel um, and, and accounting for some connectivity uh, factors. And so we were able to come up with kind of a, an acreage, essentially, of a typical response shed using the Madison response times. And then the question is, okay, how many people um, are living in the, in in the that uh, response shed uh, at, at any given density, and the question is, you know, is that maximizing the use of that fire engine? So if you assume that a, a typical fire engine can ha handle 3,000 calls per year, um, you know, how many people do you need to maximize that capacity? Um, and what we found is that. Um, you actually do maximize the capacity of one, one fire engine at, at relatively low densities, but below that, uh, there are actually dramatic increases in costs. Um, and in terms of the station costs, um, that's another thing that, that will get spread out basically across the number of people in the response shed for that given station. Uh, that's something that can be spread out even more. So um, we found that you know, the greatest savings are moving from very low densities to kind of low densities, but there are marginal savings even beyond that as you go into to high, uh, higher densities. Um, of course, this is, this is what we found in Madison, and it does depend on um, kind of call rates and response times uh, and other factors that may be different in other communities, uh, but this is at least what we found in Madison. So for solid waste, uh, we actually have not modeled solid waste because we have not been able to get the, uh, the root data uh, either from Madison or, or anywhere else for, for that matter. Um, so it's not actually reflected in our results for, for Madison, but um, we're hoping to incorporate this at some point when we can get the data. But the basic argument is simply that in a low density situation, uh, the, the truck is going to need more time to pick up at each desti destination, and that means that uh, for each shift, it can cover fewer pickups. And ultimately, that will mean uh, either more shifts and uh, more employee time or more trucks and so forth, and as well as more fuel. So there should be a connection between density uh, and, and solid waste operating costs. So to kind of sum it up in Madison, uh, this is what it looks like, just assuming a, a hypothetical residential program. And, and this is the total cost per capita. So on the bottom, you see what we're calling the other, the non-density related costs. Um, so this is police is probably the main one, but all the other functions that, that uh, we do not think were related to density. As you can see, they don't vary at all based on the, the, the density. Um, but the other categories, which include roads, fire, water, and sewer, they, they do vary. And it is a significant savings moving from uh, two per acre where the costs are you know, roughly $900, $950 per capita uh, when you move up to 16 per acre where it drops to less than $700 per acre. Uh, it's actually a one-third uh, savings moving from two per acre to 16 per acre. So it's fairly significant savings just in terms of uh, costs. So cost is obviously just one component of the fiscal impact analysis. The other component is the, the revenues uh, that it would generate. So, you know, we think that the density can affect the revenues uh, basically in two ways. One is, you know, if you put more property, if you put more stuff that can be taxed, uh, then you'll, you'll get more value per acre just by putting more property on it. And that certainly is a factor that's, that's relatively easy to model. Uh, the other way that density can increase value is by uh, spurring this kind of walkable urban premium. Um, and that can actually increase the value of each unit of real estate. So it's not only that you're putting more real estate there, but you're making each unit, each square foot of real estate more valuable. Um, 
And that's kind of what you see. This is, this is some work that uh, we did recently in Boston where we tried to categorize the entire metro, metro area based on whether it was walkable or drivable and then look at its uh, assessed values. And as you can see, uh, you know, these walkable walk-ups, what we're calling them, which have the highest density, although still not incredibly high, even in Boston, uh, it's less than one FAR. You know, they had an average assessed value per acre of $6.5 million. Uh, if you compare that to the drivable subdivisions, um, it was only about $250,000 per acre. So you can see that the combination of these effects can generate enormous uh, impacts on the revenues per acre and the efficiency uh, that you get um, from, from each acre in terms of revenues. Um, and this is just an example in, in Madison. So we just kind of looked at, to, to kind of show what this might look like, we looked at a couple of different neighborhoods in, in Madison. Uh, one has you know, a lot size of about 4,800 square feet. The other has a lot size of about 17,000 uh, square feet. So that, you know, 17,000 square foot lot equates to about 2.5 units per acre. The other one equates to about uh, nine per acre. And you can see that the, the land value for the smallest lot size is in fact a little bit less, but the total home value ends up being the same. Um, uh, that's not necessarily true, but it, it, it means that even on a smaller lot, it doesn't necessarily mean that your home is going to be worth less. Um, <coughs> and so the result of that is that, you know, on a per acre basis for the city of Madison, you're generating, you know, $34,000 per acre on the higher density scenario, whereas on the, the, the uh, less dense scenario, you're only generating $9,500 per acre. So fairly simple, really. Uh, it's just a, the, the point is that, you know, more density is going to maximize uh, the revenue that you get from each acre. Um, and then, of course, you know, it's great to talk about the fact that the density may maximize your revenue per acre, but, you know, what if the market doesn't want it? And so it's a question of, you know, does the market want density? And, you know, I think the answer is, um, well, the answer is I haven't specifically analyzed the market for Madison, but I can tell you from other places that the answer is probably yes, and probably more so than, than, than anyone really realizes. Um, we recently completed some work in Boston that I mentioned, and we found there that, you know, for the really walkable urban places, uh, you know, office space had a value premium of 150% over drivable. Um, for uh, homes, it was about 80%. And in fact, at least in Metro Boston, the only homes to have seen any increase in value over the past 10 years were those in walkable urban places. Uh, those in drivable uh, places uh, basically saw their value stagnate. Um, so we, we definitely see a lot of evidence um, for market interest in these walkable urban places. And I think that's, that's even true, this is a fairly crude statistic, but if you just look at Dane County uh, and even the United States as a whole, um, you're seeing a lot more multifamily development as a percentage of new housing development. In fact, in Dane County, more than half of new permits in the last few years have been for multifamily development. So I think there's clearly an interest in density and, and you know, we think from, uh, you know, based on a variety of demographic reasons, there's going to be a lot more one and two person households, uh, a lot more you know, households without children that are going to be far less interested in suburban single family homes. We, we think there actually is going to be a lot of, uh, a lot more interest in density. And certainly, you know, we're showing the results from a poll, but, you know, only 8% of millennials and, and only 7% of boomers say they want to live in a drivable suburban place. Right? So I think there's a lot of uh, actual interest in, in walkable urban places. So um, all this is to say, you know, we would have to do a specific market analysis for Madison to, to really say what the potential is, but there probably is a lot of potential for more density um, in Madison. So let me talk uh, about the, the final results. Uh, and what we evaluated. So we actually looked at Madison's Pioneer District. Uh, it's about 1,400 acre, mostly vacant parcel uh, at this point in the kind of the far western edge of, of Madison. And we were given a couple of different development scenarios and uh, I'm really going to talk about what we're calling the original program here, which had a certain number of uh, single family detached units, a certain number of multifamily units, and a certain amount of commercial, mostly uh, office space. And what we thought we would do is, is basically you know, test this program at a variety of densities. So in other words, keep the amount of development constant, but vary its compactness, vary the amount of land that it takes up, and use that to test 
um, the, the model and, and figure out how much savings can really be associated with density. So uh, we tested a low density scenario, which would actually use up more acreage than, than is even in the Pioneer District, so it's a purely hypothetical scenario. We tested kind of the, the base program, which would use up all of the land at 1,400 acres, and then a more compact one at 915 acres. Um, and, and these are the results. So these are the total projected costs. Um, at the low density, it comes to about $14.3 million. And under the compact one, it's about $12.5 uh, million. So it's about $1.6 to $1.8 million uh, in savings. And, and just so you know, the, these numbers represent the annual costs to the city uh, at build out in today's dollars. Um, so it's a it's a static model. It just assumes build out, and these these those numbers are are annual numbers. Then uh, the other thing to test was you know what's the the tax revenue, and, and for this we've actually presented this on a per acre basis. Um, as you can see on on the low density scenario, you're getting about six thousand dollars per acre uh, in in tax revenues, whereas under the compact scenario, it jumps to about sixteen thousand dollars. Uh, per acre, and uh, right now these numbers do not take into account any walkable premium. It's purely just having more property on a smaller footprint. Um, we were actually quite conservative in, in the revenue assumptions uh, at this point. So, if you uh, basically subtract the revenues, uh, you sub subtract the cost from the revenues. This is this is the result that you get. This is the the net fiscal impact of the bottom line uh, for each of these scenarios. Uh, and so as you can see, for the city of Madison, uh, the net fiscal impact on the low density scenario is about you know, $500 per acre, which um, you, you could almost say is break even from a kind of a rounding perspective. And, and, and given the margin of error in this model, it's almost break even. Uh, but that, that rises to over 1,000 under the base and then rises again to over 2,000 under the compact scenario. We also, we also uh, modeled this for the school district. Um, and the, here, the, 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 the main things driving this is just the, the compactness. You're putting more uh, on each acre, but also the, the slight decrease in, in school transportation costs. Um, and then the final two scenarios, the plus 50 and the compact plus 50, they assume a different development program. They assume a more dense development program, um, which we then test at the end at, at a, a more compact footprint. And as you can see, the relationship more or less stays the same, uh, the more compact footprint saves the city money and increases the net fiscal impact uh, per acre. Um, now, I mentioned that this does not reflect any kind of walkable urban premium because uh, we haven't done the work yet to really figure out what that premium might be given these scenarios and that location. But um, you know, if we assumed a, a 20 percent value premium, uh, this is what the results would look like. And, and it actually uh, adds a tremendous uh, amount to the, the net fiscal impact uh, per acre, as you can imagine. And you know, 20% is, um, uh, it's, a, it's a round number and, and, and it's an arbitrary one, but I can tell you um, from our experience in Boston and DC and Atlanta where we have tried to analyze these, these the premiums, 20% uh, is a pretty reasonable and conservative number. Um, and I think one that would be absolutely achievable. Um, and again, these, these numbers, uh, you know, they represent basically the annual operating costs as well as a few selected capital costs that were particularly related to items that we thought were affected by density. But um, it's not a complete accounting of all the costs that would be associated with new development. We did not, for example, try to uh, figure out what uh, the capital costs might be that would be associated for, with new rec centers or public health facilities and, and things like that. Um, it's primarily operating costs plus a few select uh, capital costs for those items that were related to density. Um, so I just want to talk about you know a few limitations of the model, a few things that that we are still working on. Uh, as I mentioned, there are potential cost savings related to density for other uh, cost categories that we have not incorporated. So like I said, this does not incorporate uh, any cost savings that may be associated with solid waste pickup. Uh, it doesn't include any, any cost savings associated with police. Um, we're still working on getting better, better data, particularly for the solid waste question that will allow us to do that. I think given better data on schools, for example, we might be able to produce a more sophisticated model there. Um, you know, one thing to remember is that 
uh, although this model is specifically designed to evaluate the, the impacts of density, um, you know, the, the, the traditional issues that affect all fiscal impact analyses, such as the, you know, the mix between commercial and residential space, and the values that you assume for each unit development, the value that you assume for a, a single family home or a, a multifamily apartment, um, all those continue to be very important in this equation. Um, and they can easily offset some of the cost savings and density if you were to, to say, all right, if I'm going to uh, you know, reduce the, the assumed home price by $50,000, what would that do to the cost? That may swamp some of the savings and density. So what we've done here is assume all else is equal, essentially. Um, but the model is capable of testing those, those other scenarios. Um, and then lastly, I would just say that, you know, we're looking for, for, for your input to, to make this model better. Like any model, it's based on a lot of assumptions, and we've done uh, the best we can. But um, we know that there are, there are other sources out there that we may be able to use, and some of you may be uh, more familiar with the data that's out there, particularly for the city of Madison. And uh, we'd really love your input uh, because we want to keep improving the model as best we can. Pass it back to Chris. Thanks. Uh, just to uh, sum up a few things. Uh, first, I uh, want to emphasize the point that Patrick made that uh, we've been very conservative in this. So uh, even in the results that we've obtained, they are probably understated. Uh, he, he mentioned a, you know, a few of these reasons. But you know, to sum up, on the revenue side, we probably you know, are missing a big walk premium uh, that we hope to be able to better model in a way that we feel confident coming out of you know, local data. Um, so we think we're understating on the revenue side. On the cost side, as Patrick mentioned, there's some things uh, that we haven't modeled, so we're only identifying the cost we could actually get our hands on, so there probably you know, a, is a bigger factor there. And then thirdly, in the more compact scenarios that uh, you saw, uh, there's a factor that there is land that is unused uh, for development when we uh, put the development on a smaller portion of it, and that has value. If we have land that is not used, it can something else can be done with that in the future. It might be more development, or it might be not development. It might be most valuable in cases, for instance, of things like parkland, which you will also need for a growing community, and which, if you have to acquire, you know, is much more expensive. When uh, you know, if you spread out the development farther, there's less <coughs> land to acquire, and it's harder to get. So you know, there's a value to the preserved land that, um, again, is not part of the dollars that are being claimed here in the results we have. So just uh, you know to bear that in mind. Um, in any case, uh, you know this, this is a work in, in progress, as Patrick said. Um, we uh, we think we can get uh, more and better results as we move along, which will be useful both to you know individual communities directly and uh, overall for uh, understanding the nature of the choices that we make. Um, so to uh, kind of sum up, uh, certain public costs clearly are driven by the density and the the pattern of development. Uh, fiscal impact models have been used for a long time, and in many ways they're very sophisticated, but they tend not to account for the marginal geographic effect on the variation in density, uh, which is what we're trying to get uh, to get to here. Um, all else being equal, uh, more compact development imposes a smaller cost burden on local governments, and the savings can be significant. By developing in a more compact fashion, we use land more efficiently, and we maximize the revenue yield per acre, which helps our budgets. With the right design in place, and design really is critical, I mean, we haven't really, we've talked about density, but it does assume that the more dense compact development is done with an urban design that supports walkability, and enough critical mass, because you do need some density, uh, compact development can foster that work walkable urban environment, which command the value premium that Patrick was referring to. And the combination of this uh, will have a positive net fiscal impact to a given locality. Uh, we've uh, been doing this work in collaboration with RCL Co., uh, one of the nation's major uh, real estate uh, analysts. And uh, these are the uh, folks who've been working on this project, uh, along with some others. Uh, and uh, for people who may be interested in this for other communities, Smart Growth America and RCL Co. are ready uh, to work with you if you're interested. You can get more information from our websites. Uh, you can also um, write us if you uh, send a note to info at smartgrowthamerica.org. Uh, we'll be happy to uh, respond. And uh, you will also be able to find this, uh, inf this presentation and other uh, information, including more detailed information from the report, uh, on our website at uh, <coughs> www.smartgrowthamerica.org. Uh, and with that, I'm going to turn it back to Catherine to talk about some of the 
Madison specific uh, issues. And I think, is that the right slide? Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris and Patrick. So I just wanted to introduce our, mostly our online viewers to uh, some of the things that we're doing in Madison, why this tool is important to us and how we intend to use it in the future. Um, Madison is a city that is about 200, we're reaching that 250 population point. And we know that when cities get to that point, they start accelerating um, and attracting more residents. So we wanna make sure that we're keeping up with this growth. We expect to add 40,000 new residents by 2040. And this is a, a pretty uh, conservative growth estimate. I'm seeing Mike Slavney shaking his head in agreement with that. Um, in the last year, in 2014 alone, we had $344 million of new construction. We added 2,038 new dwelling units in 2014. And we were also named the most compact mid-sized city in the United States. We ranked in the top 20 along cities like New York um, and other large metropolises. So this is really pretty spectacular that our growth pattern already is very compact. And that's due in large part to our lake city lake geography. We have a downtown that sits on an isthmus, and we know that our regional growth strategy has to depend on uh, a, the links between activity centers that are distributed throughout our community. And when we look at our larger region, um, we know that we are uh, becoming a more populous county. So we're losing some of the share of the population, and we know that's going to some of our edges. So we've been really focused on how do we keep some of that in the city and encourage our, our neighbors to keep their growth compact as well, because we know that's going to be a more competitive way for us uh, to, to grow as not just the city of Madison, but a region within the United States. And when we look at this, we, we are focusing quite a bit right now in our transportation and land planning efforts to um, organize our city around activity centers that are linked to the downtown by a BRT system. Uh, we are currently working with uh, the U.S. Department of Transportation on a Tiger Grant, and that is a transportation investments genera generating economic recovery. We're looking at um, applying a tool called the Urban Footprint, which assesses things like land use, transportation, economic development, uh, uh, housing, environmental concerns, public health, and other things. We really want to understand how is new development going to perform. Um, we, we need to have what is considered our, our own type of pro forma. We, we don't want to just wantonly grow. We want to make sure that every investment we make in infrastructure, the way we house people, leads to economic performance, but also health, happiness, variables that are sometimes a little hard to quantify. And so what Chris was talking about in terms of understanding those, um, those kinds of walkable premiums, we're doing things like working with Carpsy, who um, has started an active living places index to really start to calibrate and understand what is that premium for a walkable city and then how do we apply that in the compact places where we want to grow when we where we've got support from a, a transit rich system so we're taking a look at uh, the west side of town in particular we have the activity centers as we've mentioned and we're looking at places around the west side between the uh, Westgate West Town Mall area, which will be one of the transit station areas, and Epic, a large employer that has come to our, that has started in our region and is developing on our western edge. They are adding thousands of employees per year, and we need to be able to keep up with that growth. Um, Dane County accounted for 73% of all new jobs in Wisconsin. Uh, 27%. 27% of all of the new jobs created in Dane County between 20, 2001 and 2012 are a result of EPIC. And our economic development group has been doing a lot of work really understanding how our city fits within the regional economy and how as a regional economy we can be really competitive. But that has some implications for our land use. We have a university research park in this area, that one that's existing and one that is growing. Um, we know there are going to be a, a 
large number of jobs in this area. And we also have learned from Epic that their employees are a younger, innovative set, and that 34% of them are choosing to live downtown. But what's interesting is that 43% are choosing to live in this rapid growth area on our western side. Um, they're wanting to live near the, the amenities of um, the shopping amenities and in those close-in neighborhoods where they can get access to downtown but also access to uh, the Epic campus. So for us, having the fiscal impact tool helps us understand the growth impacts on our tra tax base. It helps us make the case for compact development it helps us support a regional investment in transit, and it helps us support the regional uh, economic growth strategy by linking our innovation districts, preserving farmland, making concessions and concerns for watershed protection, and really focusing on efficient mobility. Uh, so these are a number of ways that we plan to use this tool. As we move forward, we're getting ready to undertake a, an update to our comprehensive plan. Uh, we're integrating the work that has been done in our housing strategy and our economic development strategy. And these things are really going to come together and help us make good decisions in the future as we grow. So thank you very much. And I'm going to turn this back over to Patrick Lynch and Chris Zimmerman to answer questions for the next few minutes. So could we go ahead and start with questions? Hi, Steve Steinhoff with the uh, Capital Area Regional Planning Commission. And uh, approaching this from a regional perspective, it, you know, I wonder to what extent can the tool be scaled you know, to a regional level, especially you know, given that a lot of the inputs are very specific uh, at a municipal level. And we have a region of 60 un units of government. And so how can we apply this at a broader region? Well, I'd say in principle, scaled more broadly would actually produce more robust results. So I think you know we'd like to be able to apply it you know to as wide a, a base as possible. Uh, there is of course the complexity then uh, because of the typical municipal structure um, and the difficulty of getting data that's relevant. Um, but in principle, uh, if uh, more units of government in a region or some kind of regional government in some cases were interested in working with us, uh, I think we'd be very interested in, in trying to do that. Patrick, you want to address that? Yeah, and I, I think, you know, in general, the principles that we're looking at apply regionally as well as they do locally. Uh, and then the, the issue is really how detailed and how sophisticated do you want to get for each municipal budget. Uh, I think that there are options sort of ranging from, you know, addressing every single municipality to something more regional, perhaps less precise. Uh, that we could do. Like selecting a few places yeah. that kind of give you a distribution within a region of different types of community, which might give you a pretty good idea. If you had, you know, representative communities among your many municipalities, they probably fall into certain kind of, kinds of categories in terms of their, their type of development, their distance from the center, and so on. So if we had a sampling of them, we could also probably can come up with results that would be meaningful on a regional level. Yeah. So as you uh, generalize more, you still think that you could probably produce results that would be useful at, the, at a broader region, generalize that, you know, averaging out the inputs or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. We have uh, another question. Yes, sir. Hi, I'm Aaron Oliver from University Research Park, and I'm just curious what the implications are from a developer's perspective. Um, in particular, it seems like there's a lot of additional costs to developing in a denser way from structured parking to more expensive stormwater systems or um, even more, more creating more of a street grid instead of curvilinear streets. And I'm just curious how this looks from a developer's perspective and what, what the takeaway would be for us. So th there's a couple of different uh, issues here. One is uh, if you're talking about from scratch, the difference of developing in a, an urban form versus a more car-oriented suburban form, or if you're talking about developing in an existing area that has you know, been an urban area and you're, you're doing infill projects and that kind of thing, they have different types of challenges. So uh, in principle, in, on a greenfield basis, um, there's, there's not as much difference. But uh, in practice, when we're talking about the choice between building in a new, fresh green field versus developing in you know, an existing urban center, uh, we often do see you know big differences there and the uh, obvious uh, reluctance of many developers to get into the complications that are involved in 
uh, developing in urban areas. That's part of the thing that had held back um, the, uh, you know, the, the, the rebirth of the cities, basically, that we're now seeing in the country. And it's notable that it's happening anyway. Um, but I, I think that we have to remember that part of those things are, you know, the real difference of the ease of operating on a green field. Um, but a lot of it is because we made rules that made that easy, and we haven't necessarily made it easy to develop in, you know, in urban centers. Um, that there's often a difference in regulation. Um, we often don't price things really rationally, so we we make it very inexpensive to put in new infrastructure. We're often subsidizing that in one way or another, uh, and we're not necessarily taking into account the long-term costs of the infrastructure. So in the older part of town, we have the old infrastructure, and we say, well, it's expensive because we've got to re-upgrade that, and it's hard to do, and we think it's cheaper doing it in the new place, but we're not really taking in full life cycle costs, and that, again, can make the you know, the, uh, the more suburban development appear cheaper. Um, so I, I think that, you know, developers are naturally going to respond to the realities of the uh, economic conditions that they face when they go to develop something. Some of those arise from, you know, natural conditions, so to speak, in the market and, um, you know, the physical realities, but a lot of them are generated by our own policies. And so I'd say the first thing to look at is, you know, what are we doing that's making it more difficult? Uh, it, there are some aspects of developing in a more compact form that may be inherently more expensive that, in, in, that requires some more absolute value of, of, of infrastructure. But again, you have to look at that as, you know, what is that on a per capita basis, really? You know, how much is it supporting? Because, you know, again, you're, you're gonna have less in the way of investment in roads and pipes and so on in a smaller area serving more people. It may be a lot in an absolute sense, but, you know, per capita, per household, per taxpayer, you know, you measure it. Uh, far less so. And on the other side, you have to look at the difference in the revenue. Uh, and when markets are proven and when developers see the revenue premium, then they're willing to take on the larger cost. There are parts of this country in which that's clearly already happened, and developers know that uh, and take that into account. Financers, you know, take that into account. Uh, in many places that are just kind of emerging, and you can sort of see the premium, and, and you know, this is certainly an area where you can see, you know, some really exciting uh, you know, urban places. You, you may not yet have fully proven the market to the degree that makes developers who've been doing things in a certain way comfortable with that. Uh, so I think that is part of the challenge. Uh, how do we make the development climate better for people who would be interested in doing this? And how do we uh, help to kind of prove the market so they see results that will then encourage more people to take on what at this point might look like more of a challenge? Others? Well, I think at this point we probably have to say goodbye to our web audience. Uh, we'll stay and answer more questions, but uh, we do uh, have to say goodbye to those who are, uh, have been watching us on the web, and I'll say again to them if uh, they want to uh, pursue this further, they can go to our website uh, at smartgrowthamerica.org and find the report and uh, other information and ways to contact us. So uh, thank you very much. And uh, now we'll...